first time I came here, it was like, it was a transformative uh, experience. It was powerful and violent experience. It was as if it was just like taking acid for the first time, meaning, what do I do now? I, I see the whole world in a different way. I often compare the experience of going to Japan for the first time, going to Tokyo for the first time, uh, to what what Eric Clapton and uh, Pete Townsend must have gone through, uh, the reigning guitar gods of, uh, of, of England. What they must have gone through the week that Jimi Hendrix came to town. You hear about it, you go see it. A whole a window opens up into a whole new thing. And you think, what does this mean? What do I have left to say? What do I do now? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special instant classic edition of Nick's Nonfiction. You're here with your host, Nick Muniz. We've got a repeat. We are paying homage to a second year anniversary, the passing of a legend, Anthony Bourdain. His second book here, the middle of his career, Medium Raw. A man who has seen more Earth than Magellan, Marco Polo. He is a world traveler, a producer, started 0.0 Productions. You know him from the Food Channel. You know him from Netflix. No reservations, parts unknown. His New York Times bestseller, Kitchen Confidential, was our biggest show last year. We are going to definitely give Anthony Bourdain his due today. After sweating it out in the underbelly of New York Hell's Kitchen, he finally cashed in his lottery ticket. This is his tell-all platform, whereas Kitchen Confidential, if you remember, was the accounts of all those grubby chef tricks that you know, and now he is analyzing his peers. With that book, Bourdain secured this platform, and I think it was Shakespeare who said, you only get one shot, do not miss your chance to blow. Bourdain seized it with this second opportunity. This is how you'll learn today he secured funding from the Food Network and then attention with CNN. He had the highest rated show on CNN up until he killed himself. Within a decade, Bourdain went from line cook to anchor of one of the biggest three-letter networks on television. He lived a life that many of the people who have ever existed would have wanted to. No borders. He goes where he wants to and does what he wants. He's been through the depths of despair. He was a heroin addict. And he has taken it to the heights of glory in the Swiss Alps or eating the stinkiest cheese and best wines. It was announced. This is huge news before we get into it today. Bourdain had a late novel he was working on, posthumously. It's going to be released in October. He has, this is like going to be the final new work of Anthony Bourdain, which I know this is why we get the clicks. I wish if I saw anything with this guy's name on, I'd see, oh, lost uncut footage from some foreign land they were, you know they took the Iran episode off of part, off of Netflix? <laughs> Talk about censorship in China, look right under your nose here. Hopefully there's no uh, censorship in Bourdain's new book coming in October, that one's obviously going to be on the show we'll probably kick off 2021 with that one give everybody a couple months to set in no spoilers but today we have the middle of his career aptly named medium raw before the about the author i'm a food critic we know here i've had a uh, yelp review review we got a new platform on the channel we reviewed bo Casa mexican grill they could shove their burritos up their own butt because after my review bo Casa shut down you know, it might have had something to do with the federal government shutting down the economy for a quarter of the economic year. They're not coming back. I got to do one of the last reviews of this restaurant, and we will learn today how reviewing food, it's an art. He is, you know, one of the best writers out there, so I'm going to do as much justice as possible for our man, Anthony Bourdain, about the author. We'll breeze over it. We've done it before. He was born in 1956. The oldest of three boys was raised and said he'd forever be in New York City, which he was born in New Jersey. He was born in North Jersey. I'm within the blast radius of the Bourdain birth. He, there's some aura in the atmosphere there. You know how many famous people are from North Jersey? 
he's trying to claim New York City residency, but he um, lived there, worked there, paid his taxes there, rightfully so. He used it as a launch pad for his travels at the end of his career. It is a great hub. You got three major airports, Newark, LaGuardia, JFK, within 30 minutes. So you could really catch any flight you want at any time. His dad was a camera salesman, cameraman salesman growing up. They were well off. They would take boat rides over to France. This is where he got his uh, storytelling abilities and love of food. Graduated from the CIA, Culinary Institute of America, that is, in 1978, which, very interesting. There's a part of this book we won't spoil too much, but he took a little sabbatical summer down in the Caribbean and was cooking for very rich people. I don't, we're not going to bring it all on the show today, but you know the ties that uh, Anthony Bourdain potentially has. Working for CNN, that'll draw any conspiracy theorists' attention or any conservatives' attention. Nobody likes CNN on that side. You know, they think he had ties. He was cooking for people in Jeffrey Epstein's circle. Yo, what was that guy that was just on a, he was on Joe Rogan like a few months ago. One of the most famous chefs in the world. There's millions of views on it. Give it a Google. He was Jeffrey Epstein's chef. They didn't even mention it on the show. That's how mainstream that show is. But at least I can bring it up in the about the author here. <laughs> um, his first bestseller, Kitchen Confidential, Bourdain, was published in 2000. Immediately was a bestseller. He thought it was going to like resonate with all the people who were grinding it out on the line, the line cooks. But it, all the like white moms bought it. This is how you go mainstream. And they were like, oh, look at my cute little tips. He made it one way or another. And this is his follow-up, No Reservations, was the TV show he was doing in between the writing. That was for Travel Channel. Just go look at the Anthony Bourdain travel map. It is majestic. I'm telling you, this guy has seen more Earth than a sperm whale. Those guys live for 400 years and just circle the globe their entire life. That's what Bourdain was up to. He was a judge on the taste for three seasons, which we will get into in this book, his whole Food Network career. It's all about mainstream because this is Bourdain. He's the edgy chef. He didn't want to sell out, and he admits at this point of his career, he sold out for a little bit. But, spoiler, he books a decade old. At the end, he's like, I respect the hustle of Bobby Flay. He's my buddy now. I see that he has. he's making a dollar. Bourdain made his own dollars, started 0.0 productions toward the end. That's what Parts Unknown was completely produced by him, 2013 to 2018. Till the suicide in France, for reasons unknown, they say, which we could speculate, because I've already thrown half the listeners out, probably. We didn't need them. His uh, girlfriend was texting this, like, 14-year-old. The fo- I think he might have been barely of age, 17 and a half. There's pictures of them nudes going around. Apparently those got back to Bourdain. So if your wife is screwing around with a teenager, you're like, you get it. (laughs) This book was written in 2010. It is a review of the explosion in his career within that decade. Line chef to CNN anchor. Let's start it out. Chapter one, he called it selling out. Anthony Bourdain, imagine it in his voice. I'm not going to do an impression this time around. Yeah, I will. I was reckless when I wrote Kitchen Confidential, young and angry. He's uh, trashing his co-workers from the top. (laughs) He does bring up towards the end of the book, we're not going to throw and make you memorize characters, but he checks in on everybody from the last book. He's saying, I was reckless. Apologizes for outing his manager from that Maryland crab shack who would do heroin together, so (laughs) you guys both did it. He's just doing damage control to start the book out. Bourdain just considers himself naive when he wrote Kitchen Confidential. He had disdain for all things Food Network. He thought anybody who's taken a six-figure check didn't really stand for what the line cooks did. They weren't really counterculture. You are culture at that point. He exposed in chapter one here how Emeril and Bobby Flay look nothing like they do when you watch them on TV. He was fooled. By the shiny magic box, the television. It has so many special effects. That's what these studios are for. He said when he went to cook in the convection kitchens for the first time where, like, Rachel Ray does her morning shows, most of it is fake. You know, she pulls the... (laughs) She already has a meatloaf brewing in the oven underneath, and then she just pulls it up into the shot when she threw some slop underneath. There's probably some people that are going, wait, can I get this magic microwave? But... 
<laughs> maybe that's what Bourdain was thinking too. He was so zooted when he was watching it in his early years. While he was writing this, Anthony was working at Sullivan's at the time. He had his first baby. The Food Network was requesting him to cook salmon on TV. And he was working on a crime novel as well, working fiction and nonfiction. He was releasing graphic novels before he passed. The crime one was called Bone in the Throat. A little kitchen crossover to a detective half-chef. That could be a good read. And so when he went in to cook that salmon, this is when he found out the utensils that the Food Network gave him weren't even washed. You get some production assistant that moved to Hollywood and is getting paid nothing on some union salary or whatever. No salary for him. Kid's not washing the utensils, and one of the best chefs ever, Anthony Bourdain, has to cook salmon with grime. So for the first few years, he did a couple of these with the Food Network, and he just dismisses it. He's not. He doesn't hate it. He just thinks... And really, he is, his name is bigger than the Food Network at that point. Like, I'm saying he carried CNN toward the end. Tucker Carlson could go start his own network. Uh, Don Lemon could easily have his own app. So Anthony's cruising off his own name. Kitchen Confidential was a bestseller for five years straight. And he was t- still too scared. I said he was working at Anthony Sullivan's, that Italian place. He was too scared to quit his job. He's getting gigs on the Food Network. His mentality, he is really one of these (laughs) freelancer. Your time in the sun can't last too long. So he made a deal with the Food Network after they liked his salmon chefing. And he got an advance for a camera crew. And they said, go to East Asia, whatever countries you were saying in this pitch that you wanted to go to, and learn how to produce. So he got that small budget. But at this point, he was still a coke fiend, making good money. But new sports cars weren't the cure. He has an anecdote coming in a little bit. Shows how he was able to get over the material goods. How he became the edgelord that he is. People with a mind like Anthony, the insight that buying more material fuels the addiction. So he minimalized. He found solace in telling stories. This was what this whole advance, it kind of saved him in this five-year period. He was back in the kitchen after he just wrote a New York Times bestseller. You think you're free, you're out of it. And he got back into the coke, but he made his way out of it, so he's just giving us a little update on his drug usage in chapter one. He also had a book tour going to wrap up the chapter, five-year bestseller, and he was answering the same questions with the same answers, the same stories. He felt like a hoe just going to do all these talk shows. It's an old bar joke. Would you fuck me for a million dollars, sweetie? Yeah. Would you hook up with me for one dollar? Ew, no way! Okay, well, we've established you're a whore. What's the price now? This is what Anthony is saying. Okay, so I'll go do these little salmon cookings whenever I need to. I I have sold out. I'm just not selling out to the max. If I'm going to sell out, I might as well make the most of it. So he wants to double down with the Food Network's production crew. He asked for some help. No one else is at this level. Very few people get to see this much success in your life, and you see how much it messes with your brain how his story ended. Anthony goes over to Emeril and is like, how do you fucking do this? You look like you work a lot. Emeril goes, yeah, it takes me uh, two weeks to return a phone call to people. It's not a normal situation, but look at how many people I entertain. Look how many people I employ. Emeril has his own network like I was talking about before. If you get bigger than the network, you can employ your own people. And he said, the way I do this is keeping business personal so I don't lose interest. Only do projects that you are interested in. Stop cooking salmon. And he goes, but look at the guy, Gordon Ramsay. He's not a normal person, obviously. What is a superpower that I would want? The rage of Gordon Ramsay. Imagine how good of a rant that man could go on if you got him properly worked up. <laughs> Guy's got superpowers. The whole chef community, Emerald was telling Bourdain that Ramsay, he's a functioning workaholic. This guy is 100% momentum. No one's ever seen him sit down before. Towards the end of selling out here, The Food Network offered Anthony Bourdain just a crappy sauce pot line, and they they said they would put his name on it for $40,000 a month for life. It's just like this South Beach diet. Someone has to be the face for it. Wolfgang Puck has all those pizzas. They were saying, Bourdain, you got your pot sauce line. We got you. In his first book, he was going, the most important thing is a hard bottom sauce pot pan that you can kill an intruder your kitchen with. You have boning knives. Why do you need a saucepan? 
He's getting this deal with Food Network to sell rinky dink saucepans, and this is his ultimate sellout point. He had the chance to go hyper mainstream, you know? What I'm saying before, it's a spectrum. His daughter is almost born, but Bourdain, he's not going to sell out. I said before, you're hoeing yourself out in the business. He is saving his cherry for the right guy. It takes us to chapter two the happy ending. So he thinks he's at. He's got the bestseller, he's got the Food Network deal. What could possibly go wrong? Starts us out with a little personal history again. As a kid, he always loved, he loved life, but he resented the fact that his parents wouldn't let him make his own mistakes. Thinks they were a little helicopter-ish, but I guess, you know, take your positives and negatives. You got to ride the Queen Mary up and down the river of Versailles. He had a weird upbringing, for sure, though. That is definitely not average. His dad showed him Dr. Strange Love at nine years old, a probably rated x when it came out why aren't there just a little coronavirus thought why can't you go to a drive-in movie theater hmm they sent him to film school at a young age mr bourdain and he remembered one of the punishments there you if it's you're at a private school a nun can whip your fingers at this film school they would make you watch a film in detention by yourself black and white old noir film of a little french boy chasing a red balloon so it's like the schindler's list you got to watch as a punishment but this top ordained the lesson the balloon will always float away it's always out of your grasp the happy ending he understands fulfillment might not be it for him from a young age he's thinking life is a joke we're all just chasing balloons around probably why his first job out of school was a dishwasher. He wasn't aiming for the stars. We learned in uh, Kitchen Confidential, there was a two-year period he was just floating around scummy kitchens before he went to CIA and just got yelled at by Michelin star chefs, which turns you into a man. The whole makeup of his childhood he summarized as a recipe for nihilism. After Anthony's first failed marriage, <laughs> nihilist lifestyle, multiple marriages, addiction, he hits what he thought was rock bottom, but it looked as the uh, looked like a light at the end of a tunnel for a time. You know, divorced dads, they're going, I'm going to have the garage to myself. It looks like you're going to have a good time, but you're losing a family and love. Looked like a light at the end of the tunnel. Bourdain moved to the Caribbean after his first divorce. He, this is when he's done with school and everything, but he thought he was at rock bottom here. He was already getting tarred out in order to make it through his shifts. And now he's down the Caribbean smoking and drinking on the beach all day, every day. Driving drunk nightly, he said. Bought a couple ATVs with his, you make good money as a chef. You could pick up double shifts anytime. Most of it is off the books. He took his quad up onto the cliffs many nights overlooking the ocean. They'd turn on the radio and whatever song was playing, Mr. Bourdain decided whether or not he was going to drive off the cliff. You've heard, uh, I pledge allegiance to the DJ. He's taking it to a whole new level. When I was 20 years old, <laughs> broadcasting to 3,000 people in Newark, Delaware over the radio, I didn't think there was a guy perched over the Delaware River ready to drive off if I played a snooze. Bangers 24-7 on 97.3. Uh, we see by this, obviously Bourdain had some suicidal tendencies from a very early age. He uh, spent a big amount of time in St. Barth's Island, which, remember, this was supposed to be the light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> and he's teetering over the edge of a cliff. He met a girl on that island. He says they uh, worked together. She was a chef, so they went on a bunch of yachts. If you're a dude, they don't want you cooking on a chef where you could potentially be hooking up with the guy's models. They want a woman chef, but luckily this girl was able to get him on these high-value gigs. Anthony was saying... These fucking reptilians they were serving ate $50 burgers. The most expensive uh, ingredients in the world being shipped from the United States and overseas into the Caribbean for these super yacht cruises. And the name of one of the subchapters here was The Rich Eat Different Than You and Me. He went into all types of detail about while they were sailing around during the day, they would just leave lines dragging off the back of the yacht and it would catch wild ocean fish and they would just fry it up. Catch an octopus, you got calamari all night. Big quote from the chapter was, Sometimes in the kitchen they say, Behind every great fortune there is a crime. Letting us in on some of how these guys are making their money, the ultra-rich. 
did see these people weren't fulfilled just like him with his ATV. These people were probably considering dropping a bowling ball through the hole of their yacht. Like uh, the Wolf of Wall Street we just went over. Jordan Belfort, he was like, I've always wanted to die at See, I guess this is a good way to go. The rich people, the ultra-rich, aren't even happy, so Bourdain's going, might as well enjoy the food. Maybe this isn't the end of the road for me. He's uh, refinding his love. What he, he got lost for a little bit, and he's finding his way back. For the rest of his time down the Caribbean, St. Barth's, he avoids bars, brothels, beaches. That does sound like the light at the end of the tunnel. Cleans up his act a little bit. Said some, there were some really eerie shit. I could usually try to pick up what the authors are getting at, but Bourdain's a more poetic writer or layered. He said, I met evil at this time down in the St. Barth's Islands. <laughs> I'm like, what are these secret islands and shit? Who are you cooking for? This is what I was just talking about before. This secret Jeffrey Epstein's cook is doing podcasts now. What the fuck? Clown world. Chapter three. So you want to be a chef. He did a big old commencement address at the end of Kitchen Confidential to, like, people graduating CIA. So if you want his real tips, check that out. These aren't real tips. He started the chapter saying, I drink alone. Probably the worst tip you could give someone. (laughs) But that's a good chef litmus test. Like, if you want to do certain professions... You gotta, if you wanna be a comedian, you gotta be able to fucking bomb in front of people. You gotta have thick skin. If you wanna be a chef, your forearms probably gotta have thick skin. You're gonna be burned a lot, and you gotta be able to drink alone as a chef, according to Bourdain. There are no windows in a kitchen. You are in a sauna of your own sweat and spices. Does this sound appealing to you? He's saying think twice before if you wanna be a chef, a little bit of a warning. Much better descriptions of kitchens back in the previous book. People refer to Anthony as a chef more than anything. But towards the end of his life in this book, he's going, I see myself as a world traveler, as a storyteller. He was a line cook for nine years. But in Kitchen Confidential, he only wound up managing like two restaurants. And being a chef, you're in charge of all of the cooks. Being a chef, he said, I love this comparison. Eating is about total submission. You're in the chef's hands. Just put it down my throat. I don't want ketchup and onions. These are the tastes they put together for a reason. We're not talking about these trendy fucking uptown places that are serving you spaghetti in a shoe. Fuck them. A real chef you are going to submit to. And being a chef with all the cooks under your control is about complete control. Dominance, you know? This is the ebb and flow from kitchen to table. It's a beautiful thing. (laughs) <laughs> we'll never see it again with the lockdowns. Wave two, wave three, wave four. What was I saying there, though? He um was a... <clears throat> I was just... I inhaled ice. There is ice in my lungs. <laughs> People refer to him as a chef more than anything. He was a cook for nine years, only chefed for three years, and then he did a bunch of other shit. So he's like, there are better chefs I will refer you to if you're looking for food advice and crap. What Bourdain knows is the lifestyle of a chef. He knows where to drink. He loves an American Irish bar to drink alone at. Doesn't matter what's on the tube. Salty food. Smells like Lysol. (laughs) An Irish bar never has a particular smell. It does smell like an American, like a luminescent light linoleum floors. A weird soulless place. It's 40 Irish pubs per city. Bourdain likes it. Bourdain likes a pool table, a jukebox, a neon Yankee sign, an owner with 12 of the same restaurants, you know, a cozy fit. He's saying, yeah, anybody could sweat over a grill for 12 hours. It's, um, you know, that's the push yourself part. But after the shift, you got to be able to hang at this pub. It's like any job, though. And it's they say coachability. If you could tell, you could teach people how to do most things. It's really if you're a good fit for the lifestyle. So in the show, you want to be a chef. He's uh, gonna address people asking, "Should I go to culinary school?" Bourdain's short answer is no. As a 28 year old veteran, don't go to culinary school. He's saying, "I went to CIA. This is the best culinary school in the nation." And I'm telling you, no, because it is now soft. They had the first book. It was called "The Ten Minutes of Hate." Like the best chef would get to rip into you, tell you what your worst qualities were in front of everybody. They don't do that anymore. It's too soft. It's a safe space now. He said, "The real determined kids nowadays go solo." 
it's better to go find a local up and coming chef that's in a I don't know the food magazines he's getting his name out there and say I like what you're doing man teach me how it this looks you could spin that so much better on a resume than just how are colleges still doing it man like <laughs> I might have been one of the last generations to go to school what the f and you're still paying the same price this is what board data is getting at it's not the same thing you're paying for also prices are changing after the first four years of culinary school you're only going to be making 10 to 12 dollars an hour you're going to be in lots and lots of debt what Bourdain suggested straight out of school instead of uh more school is uh hotel kitchens country clubs are really good to build a little bit of experience as a line cook but people rarely leave so he's saying again if you're going to be a solo and try to do it on your own stop getting tied down get your experience and move along couple insider tips as he always has when they are hiring chefs at most places they will take into account there is no hr department within a kitchen your weight is up for grabs there's only so much space and square footage in a kitchen and you don't want this big hoss a real unit that you got to maneuver around but i don't know if i agree with that one totally they always say why would you trust a skinny chef all these chefs now with their two four-way parted hair, purple tattoos and bullshit. I want a fat guy who knows what kind of greases and cheeses go together. So he says, Bourdain, before you even consider taking on loans, jump into the deep end. See if this is what you actually want to do, if it's a good fit of a lifestyle. If you're 22 years old, fit and hungry to learn, Anthony Bourdain urges you, see, he's more of a traveler than a chef, to go around the world. And you can learn much more styles of cooking. You could go study under Hiro, Jiro, whatever the guy's sushi name was over in Japan. You could <laughs> learn to roll sushi from the best and not pay. You could get paid to. And Bourdain is going, you'll know how shitty your quality of work is by how much of that drinking alone that you're doing and how many drugs you need. He said if you're working at a TGI Fridays, maybe you do need that joint to get you through your shift. Beware the addiction, though. You'll know when you're pushing yourself and when you're in your sweet spot. Some really good advice there if you want to be a chef. Chapter 4, he called it Cook Tarted. <laughs> advice off the top. So he's started stepping up onto his soapbox a little bit here towards the latter half of the chapters. Bourdain going, it's better to cook at home as often as possible. The food tastes better when you see it start to finish. That's why this is the big popularity with these open view uh cooks kitchens whatever where you could see them filleting in front of you it's a sizzler platter 24 7 i don't know why you go to have a meal and to talk and you hear say fuck you tony give me off goddamn lamb chop over here why it's popular bourdain citing some more saying there's a direct number between uh, families that are not connected have social problems and that have dinner together. You remember this? <laughs> he's all over the board. Well, he's an independent thinker is what's really going on here. The Reagan dinner campaign, that's probably the best thing that they ever did. <laughs> they might have made drugs really enticing to kids. Then the family dinner thing was huge. He says, Bourdain, since his daughter was zero years old, she's had every single dinner with the family. This was a cool part. He said in the Kennedy presidency, this was a presidential order. Remember you do the presidential fitness exam in uh, gym class? You do the pacer and all that bullshit? The Kennedys weren't making you run a mile in gym class. He made uh, home economics mandatory. The in-school cooking class was mandatory to take four years. And now we're cook-tarted as a generation, as a populace. It's not even... By year, you know, the 70s, we got Fast Food Nation coming up in a few months. It's the biggest explosion of any type of business even, but it, you've never seen the demographic of the way people eat change this quick. Bourdain went as far to say, we should know this, it used to be human knowledge to know how to use a knife and quarter an animal. Take it a level up about knowing where your food comes from, we all think meat the sacred protein that gives you muscles comes packaged on a styrofoam thing in cling wrap. Just some sketchy way to get an animal shipped to you. It's better to be part of the process. Imagine raising a chicken, knowing its name, walking around, and then frying that juicy breast up. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> Bourdain artfully said it. Rather than biting the head off your own chicken, 
Now without culinary skills, people are castaways with cash and no can openers. It's true. You've heard of uh, castaways food deserts? Those are a real ass thing. You gotta if you don't have a car, you're eating seven eleven hot dogs for every single meal. Also with the quartering thing, if you know how to kill an animal, you know you could use so much more of that. You could make your own furs. Waste in the country would be down in half if we even knew how to boil bones down to a stock. Or to make sausage. That's not even a hard one too, if you're making your own meats. The boiling your bones down, though, where would you think all that goes? Can you feed just a bone to a dog? I'm pretty sure you have to wind up throwing that out as well. Goes into the garbage island in the Pacific. But pretty cool if we knew these, like, ancient remedies, whatever, recipes. You boil down the bones, and then you can make... Pretty sure that's what Fight Club was about. You can make bombs out of that shit. <laughs> but read, like, a shampoo container. It says contains fat animal tallow. You could cook with it, too. But there's probably some, like, red marrow. Remember in college, everyone was trying to fucking stick you with a needle? Please sign up for our spine marrow registry of, like, keep your needles to yourself. I'll keep my red bone marrow. That shit is healthy. They say animals live off of it. Definitely healthier than a Big Mac. In 2008, Bourdain cited the famous chef, Sean Hansen, closed his most famous restaurant, Flamma. And this was 2008 during the big crash. We saw, just like we're seeing again right now, the chains are fine. You could go to Walmart, but you can't go to... Oh, man, that's criminal. Like, on Alameda Avenue, they have an Alameda in every city, but you have these big Mexican grocery marts. Done. But you could go to Walmart, right? That's a necessity. That's an authoritarian source. Just like now, just like 08, the big chains are able to stay alive, but all the local guys close. Even Sean Hansen, one of the best chefs in America, Flama, name of the restaurant, was saving face. They had to sell right before the crash. They knew what was coming. But Flama's a buddy of Anthony Bourdain. He looks to him for future projections. He, it's You got to know how to estimate forecast a market if you're gonna open a fucking restaurant in new york city you gotta know what block is gonna be hot this year and what's gonna die next year so they were making money flama's looking at trends he's like he's telling bourdain nobody knows how to cook this was an interesting look into the finances of restaurants flama made most of their money off of whale customers which are the people who get their own private room, are ordering bottle service all night. It's not your Joe and Jim, Jane and the 80-year-old couple that comes and gets an appetizer and a couple entrees. You're not even going to stay open if that's how your business works unless you kick people out after 25 minutes. It's these big whale customers. <laughs> and Flama, the, what was his name? He goes better as Flama. Sean Hansen was saying these are... Uh, People, the Wall Street guys who can ball out and keep us open, they have their at-home chefs. They can order groceries off of Instacart. When these depression comes, there's no way to stay alive. He's telling Bourdain, too. Like, you may be thinking about opening your own restaurant now that you have a big name. Stop it. Don't do that. I like your production company idea. Cool way he put it. Another good writer's term. The depression clears out the game so the true blue chip restaurants remain open. And, uh, it's like a forest fire. It purges down, burns everything, and creates new soil for the better new ideas to come up. The marketplace of ideas. That's America. As the market started back up, keeping in touch with Flama, Anthony and him noticed owners started to be nicer to their help. <laughs> you see people are putting on like benefits for their staff. Why did you just pay them a livable wage so they could have put enough away when things like this happen? <laughs> But we don't think proactively. It's That's like the third of Americans out of work. People, uh, service workers lose their job during the oppressions. Chefs have to tighten their order forms. Like, really cool point from Kitchen Confidential was he was working at this disco club. So they'd have meat night, lobster night. And every single time you put an order form in, it's a gamble. You don't know how much people are going to eat. So you're going to have to manage your waste and all that. In these depressions... Nobody's ordering as much food. It hurts the providers, what it was called, the shippers, the retailers. When I worked at a sushi place in Denver, we ordered we ordered fish from Oregon and Massachusetts, both coasts. It was coming in from. It shuts down the entire economy, bottom up. You know who's watching over us? We got the FDA making sure all of our food is safe. They say pizza's a vegetable. <laughs> so maybe Skittles will be fruits next year. 
when these depressions hit, people know, oh shit, people are going to eat out. Our diets get worse every single time it happens. <laughs> Chapter five, this one is called Wanderlust, to what Bourdain is so well known for. Starts with his time in Hanoi. I was a massive Parts Unknown fan. I remember senior year of college, I fucking worked for four years after every day. Came home, watched that show like an episode. I felt like I was going somewhere else in the world every single night. Everybody has these little experiences. The way Bourdain puts a story together, he will fucking transport you around the globe. Started Wanderlust talking about Hanoi. He loves Vietnam. I think his first tattoo he always talked about nonstop was done in the backwoods of Vietnam. So he would rip it up and down the long post-bombed country on the little Vietnamese motorbikes. I had a Taiwanese. Those things are amazingly fun. 70% of the population in Hanoi is under 30 years old. That's a party city, baby. 70% under 30 years old. What's going on down there? <laughs> the big food they're known for, he said, were bun cha pork chops which is at room temperature it's got this sweet sour papaya sauce they snack on snail and crab noodles when they're drinking beer and they are drinking beer all day they're back in like the stone age where water is dysenterious just drink a beer wound up spending half the chapter on vietnam this is where i believe he met that guy eric Riper. this is uh he did several episodes with him wrote many homages to his death this is the guy who was with Wardain, found him walked in on him hanging from his closet they found each other in one of the most fun cities in the world and they made many memories there they remember going down the street and they saw a group of 20 people a big family having a reunion they set up benches in the middle of a crowded street and they just put up cones they said this street is closed they set up their own block party you need a Town permits, there's no doing that in America. One of the biggest things also in Vietnam, all over Southeast Asia, and this is supposed to be, if you have a refined palate, if you like all of the tastes that food has to offer, what is it, sweet, savory, salty, umi, they have some Japanese bullshit one, if you know how to decipher all these little sub-flavors, pho is supposed to be one of the best foods on Earth. In Southeast Asia... Is the paradise of pho. How do you, can you rhyme anything with pho? So that was a big uh, tribute to Vietnam there. He started talking about Puebla, city east of Mexico City. Just beautiful women, crunchy tacos. You got cold tecates, modelos on deck. The way Bourdain writes about places, he romanticizes it. He captures a place in time, draws a picture. I'm not going to be able to do that so well. Talking a mile a minute here, slipping jokes in. It's not the perfect platform go watch parts unknown i wish i could go back to my college apartment you know roll up a joint for the first time again and watch some anthony bourdain it's like uh the way he died too is creepy you know people like that i'm sure people who were alive for all the 27 clubbers the Jimi hendrix or whatever that is these people know when they're gonna die or something and it's I, it was eerie watching that shit man and it hit me at the worst time i moved out to denver right as he passed the guy's soul is back out in the universe his spirit of wanderlust is really something you could capture it'll fucking put the wind under your wings for miles around the country around the world it's gonna take us to number six meat he called it bourdain just some riffing out here Got a few more chapters. This one, he's just talking about, I love an American hamburger. It's simple. Ground meat. You throw some salt and pepper. If you're doing it right, you mix it into the chopped meat while you're, what did they say, marinate your meat before you put it on the grill? You don't need the marinades. That's why a burger is so good. You just throw it on a bun for taste. It says a lot that that's this guy's favorite food. He's eaten everything. I've had jokes about this. He eats <laughs> it's wild, man. <laughs> I have it written down here. We'll get something new in. A feculent hot dog. Feculent hot dog. Who is shoving poop into intestines? This is like you need a murderer's a Ted Bundy mind. He was the one that was making a Frankenstein of bodies to have sex with. Who is shoving poop into a meat grinder? I mean, they eat it there. They have this thing in China or Southeast Asia Bourdain would eat called young shit. They just take the poop out of the cow's livers. I'm trying to give you the worst of the worst. Bourdain would eat uh, hog ears, snout, seal, guinea pig, bat. <laughs> he was immune to corona. 
Most burger meat in most countries, he said, would contain traces of anything other than muscle, especially in 2020. Like uh, the FDA, if you go to Canada, go across the border. I did some time at a hostel in Montreal. And what do you eat when you're in a hostel? Cheap food? Peanut butter. Their peanut butter in Canada isn't this weird, shiny, glistening chemical that we have here in America. They have different laws on the FDA. They're more, they don't, in America, they go, whoa, this is our populist people that run the country. Fuck them. We'll put chemicals in the peanut butter. (laughs) Tastes pretty good. But board days go, and even with the meat in 2020, a quarter of your meat could be uh, not muscle. Also is saying on his soapbox, stop buying chopped meat. You got to b- buy big cuts, T-bone steaks that nobody can afford. But that's because to avoid uh, mad cow disease, prions in your meat, some worms that will go into your brain. When you eat chopped meat, they just throw a bunch of cows and mix it into one patty. That's fucking gross. It's weird. <laughs> but we got to keep the meat industries open. You hear what's going on now? It's always been sus, man. If you're paying attention, they broke out the impossible burgers have been pushed on us. And you go to Starbucks, there's this soy milk is more popular. You know soy has increased amounts of estrogen, and guys who drink soy milk from birth to death have bigger titties. As a lifestyle study for you. Big titty boys drinking soy milk out here. This bullshit meat... It's coming along. We gotta avoid that shit. Anthony's saying every single year the FDA cares less, more people get bribed, and worse shit is put in our food. I think it was Tyson, the big ass chicken factory, factory who took the bribe from the FDA to shut down during COVID. But you know, go watch South Park. They did a whole entire season on the fake meat thing. Another. This goes back to his point before. Learn how to cook for yourself. Bourdain went as far. Said, "No, your butcher." This is one of the coolest jobs, you know, America bullshit jobs, butchers, people who make things, just learning how to slice and dice up a cattle, that's badass, you work with knives for a living, the biggest beef companies in America, there's money, $116 billion a year, it's bigger than most countries' GDPs, a lot of money in beef in America, we are, we're meat-eating people, get your vegan bullshit out of here, hot dogs. Bourdain is saying aren't that bad. He's eating those dirty water New York City hot dogs, pre-cooked inners. I mean, this guy eats feculent hot dogs, so how much can we trust him on his chopped meat game? We had Colorado, you can't really grow uh, crops in the land. It's at too high of an elevation, so they're known for ranching. Got some of the best meats. It's like uh, Argentina down in South America. They're in the Andes Mountains, so you get some of the best meats. And Greeley, Colorado is the biggest slaughterhouse in America. You got guys' arms being chopped into your food. It was like five people a day got hurt at that factory. I feel like, though, in Colorado, the locals get the lowest cut because the best meat's got to make it across the country, just like ordering the sushi fish. You'd buy some shit at Safeway King Supers that was gray underneath. And those are Kroger chain supermarkets, so West Coast Ralph's, East Coast uh, ShopRite. Watch out for your meat. They're selling you some gray bullshit. You could really hurt yourself if you eat bad meat, too. E. coli, you all know about it. Bourdain, in this meat chapter, is just talking about the degradation of food in America. Think about coffee. Bourdain loves a cigarette, loves some coffee. Coffee used to be an essential fuel to Americans, just like a 50-cent gallon of gas. Coffee was 50 cent per cup. And now you can't get a cup for under $2, not even at Dunkin' Donuts. America runs on Dunkin'. You're running on our money, bitch. McDonald's, I think, is the only one that stays true. That gives you like 24 ounces of bean water for a dollar. Not expensive to make. One of the biggest markups. Like, it's like uh, (laughs) a printer ink. There's just a monopoly on it. Can you? No. See, you need to have a tropical climate. You can't grow coffee beans in your backyard. Unfortunate, we're all paying... 400% more than we should be paying for coffee. And uh, this chapter is supposed to be about meat. But he had a kid, so Bourdain's bugging out a little bit. He's saying, Ronald McDonald is more recognizable to children than Jesus or Gandhi or Mickey Mouse. I remember uh, we had like VHS tapes about the McDonald's gang. And those were some good-ass movies. They had a great... Social dynamic and the McDonald's gang. Grimace was there cheering everybody, everybody up that big oaf. You got the Hamburglar, who's the edgelord. He's the Bourdain of the McDonald's crew. I'm not going to bore you with fucking 
<laughs> Why were we showed that? I mean, we're, we were raised on this crap food. Bourdain's making good points. He referenced Eric Slosher's Fast Food Nation. That's how I got the word of that book. Slosher is one of the best food writers. He visited plants all over the country, went to that Greeley beef factory. And it's criminal. Both Slosher and Bourdain are saying the way that all of it, sugar, fast food McDonald's is advertised to children. They don't have a free prefrontal cortex. Children are retarded. They will buy anything. They will say, mommy, buy me whatever is on TV right now. I'm a hoarder, man. I still have like a box of old McDonald's toys in my house in New Jersey, whatever. Shit stays with you. It's pure addiction. You're <laughs> selling kids. How is there? How's the FDA not care about this? Sugar is proven in lab studies with mice to be 10 times more addictive than cocaine. It's what we feed to our kids in sugary drinks. That's what they start their day on, their breakfast, some cocoa puffs. <laughs> That's Anthony Bourdain on meat. Chapter 7, Fatherhood. He is talking about his daughter a little bit more in this one. He says one of his favorite joys in life is taking his little girl out to get some ice cream. And while he is the tatted up, the drug doer, he says, I don't even care if I don't look cool. I like to see my daughter drool and have ice cream dripped out her face. It's adorable. <laughs> in his later career, he referenced here how he went to the war in Beirut. As soon as anybody, any journalist they consider themselves gets a camera crew, they're like, all right, what's the worst war zone in the world? Book a ticket. We're going now. He probably got some good stories there, but he's enjoying the ice cream when he came home. It gave him a little more enhanced perspective about, fuck, man, I could just go down the street and get some frozen cow milk. Native Americans used to mash up grapes and ice water to make crazy old types of ice cream. So I guess even the poorest people, that didn't help my point, even the poorest people in history have their own types of ice cream. Even in Beirut, where kids are blowing up, he's just taking his food for granted once again. He's doing a little service to his wife. Go ask Alice. Didn't age so well. Uh, they were arguing towards the end of their life, but there's no real narrative in this book. You could tell it's just a jump around. He's just trying to add some... Talking from the soapbox, he's going, start your own war garden, everybody, okay? He's acting like a little CNN here. I live in a fucking apartment, bro. There's 8 million people stacked on each other in your home city of New York. Nobody has room for fucking war gardens, okay? We're dependent on the machine. It's too late, bud. <laughs> he's got a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. He's trying to make everybody do a 180, making a safer world. You already bought her into the world, man. It's doomed. Deal with it. I agree with him. Just ribbing the guy for fun. Yo, I got comments last year. Everyone's like, you disrespected Anthony Bourdain. If he, he could take a joke. So this guy's got thick skin. I did like how he ended this one. I mean, it's, I hate when, like, you don't want to invite an animal activist or a vegan to your party. They just, they're a vibe kill. But this was uh, something you might want to hear about. Fragua duck liver, fatty duck liver. The way it's produced, Anthony and a couple other chefs put a coalition together to try to stop it. You, like, deep throat a duck with a metal feeding pipe and just shove a milkshake into its stomach. Just put the milkshake in a trough. Let the duck enjoy its milkshake before you kill it for its liver. No, it's a really disgusting way they farm these animals. Factory farming, he was on his soapbox about here, our book, Fast Food Nation. It's going to get into those issues. Stick to what you know, buddy. Keep traveling. Stop bumming me out. But here, I, I like uh, injecting some fitness and lifestyle bullshit into this show. All of that, the way they give it in a... Like, you don't just give the duck a salt lick. When you put sugar into a liquid, it goes straight to your liver. It coats your fatty liver, so it's like drinking on steroids. So if you're drinking a White Claw, I think those have the fake sugar... But if you're drinking wine, even, that's fucking terrible for you. Yeah, moderation, obviously, is better than anything. But if you're drinking soda, sh sugary soda drinks all day, you are the frog wad duck. You are factory farming yourself. So if all of us aren't going to start our own uh, war garden victory gardens, it's impossible. At least try to buy local. Stop supporting the gray beef from your Kroger supermarket. Chapter 8 is called Chef Chiefdom. Talked about his favorite chef. This is Anthony Bourdain, many people's favorite chef's favorite chef. The guy's name is Fergus Henderson. It's a cool name, Fergus. That's a cat name. Felis Catus Fergus the cat. This guy was an architect who quit his uh, perfect bistro grub pub. 
what all these kids coming out of CIA are looking for, to cook for the Queen of England. I mean, I'd say that's a step up at a gig. What is a bistro even? I hate this shit. It's a cafe. What do you call yourself a bistro for? That's not fancy. You're just confusing non-native speakers. Henderson, Fergus, is a bit of a food writer as well. Just Bourdain giving shout-outs here off the soapbox now. He's also saying his favorite food writer, Jonathan Golf for IA Weekly. Guy has a Pulitzer Prize writing about food. It's pretty impressive. And now he gets into, uh, I talked about Wolfgang Puck a little bit earlier, the guy who apparently, quotes, sold out for that big pizza, frozen pizza gig. Bourdain used to see him as the villain. He was the face of the commercial being. But Bourdain, he earned a lot of respect for Wolfgang because at all of his restaurants he saw he took fragua off the menu. It's all it takes to win Bourdain's heart. <laughs> Another villain he saw as Brooke Johnson, the head honcho at the Food Network. They are people there to make you compromise your soul. You have a vision of a product that you conjured in your head, you know, a project that came to you in sleep, a true muse. The suit, this lady Brooke at the network is going to try to say, but how is this going to meet a minority demographic? I'm in the middle of South Africa. What are you talking about? I need to bring a transgender crippled black person along with me for diversity? Fuck you. He thinks the suits still are some of the worst people in the industry because people like Wolfgang learn. He's going, okay, I'm at the top now. I have influence here. I'm also going to take Fragua off my menu. Whereas Brooke is just trying to further the illusion. She probably gets Fragua on her three martini business lunches. Trashing a lot more people in this chapter. <laughs> so it is posthumous book coming up. The post-death one. He's going to have to do the whole first chapter as an I'm sorry again. Poor Dane maybe not learning. But we love the trash. Everybody loves a good trash talk. At the time online, Bourdain, his favorite food forums were Grubster and Eater, E-A-T-R. That's a pretty cool thing. I love, it's a, like crowdsourced is how you're going to get the best reviews. Um, like user reviews. When they had that on Netflix, when they took that off, everything went to shit. Every single show became the same. A dystopian depressed teen who has superpowers or some Ozark type of fucking murder show. When you have a mass uh, voting on one thing, it's more legitimate of a review. It's the average, whereas these uh, Grubster and Eater, these food forums, every few years, they sell out. They turn over to advertisers because if you run that platform, you know how long until uh, fucking Sal's Meatballs says, Hey, I'll give you a, give you a couple Benjis this week, and uh, how about I get on the five spot of Grubster? You got to start paying service to people when you get that big. So he's always trying to say, yeah, I could try to give you these types of tips, but it turns over quick. And so now seeing uh, how Wolfgang is basically chained at the neck to his frozen pizzas and restaurants for life, Bourdain is happy at this point that he didn't take that early Food Network restaurant deal with the cheap pots. He's seeing Mario Batali. That guy is losing his entire career now. He's, like, caught up in some Pizzagate bullshit. Maybe Bourdain was offed by CNN. He got too big, and this is what he was trying to avoid. Yes, we're deep into the show. We're going crazy with it. Not much to talk about this chapter, so I'll throw it around. Let's wrap it up a little bit. Chef Chefdom. Chef Chiefdom. We learned from Kitchen Confidential that the word chef comes from chief. It's only one letter apart. So, like I said, you could teach people coachability. Anybody can cook. A chef, a chief, is a leader. Bourdain said he didn't want to be responsible for others anymore. This is why he stopped managing. Doesn't want to be. Doesn't want to be the Mario Batali. He doesn't want to be responsible for other people. <laughs> cool little point. Mister Bourdain truly is a chief of his own. Chapter nine. He called the Fury little tongue-in-cheek back to being yelled at. He has a good rule of thumb here. Restaurant owners, listen up. As a chef even, if you are putting chicken Caesar salad on your menu, it's a good sign that you've given up. It's not a new dish. You're, not, you're just trying to turn over the jam and jams, the older couples, keeping your business afloat. And this is what Bourdain is getting at. It's not having the knowable things on the menu. If you're trying to keep people around, you got to have the quality of the food Stay where it's at. A lot of the cooking shows now, 
<laughs> recipes online. You can never find just a recipe. There's always a story about some long lost aunt who she cooked these potatoes while hiding from the Nazis in the Holocaust. And this is my recipe to give to you. Bourdain is saying even with the gastro micro cock pubs, all these fucking made up words. It's not about these guys' backstories or how many sleeve tattoos or curly mustaches the chefs are. You could see through the illusion as a consumer. Everybody thinks they're a fucking restaurant reviewer and bullshit. Like, like I said before, it's hard to paint a picture and very descriptively give a definition to food. Bourdain does it well. He's trying to say be as critical as possible, though, so you're not being sold slop. Shoe spaghetti. I liked that one. <laughs> Bourdain said... If I'm waiting more than 20 minutes to eat, this wasn't worth the meal. I like food, but I definitely don't like wasting my time more than anything. If the chef is going to have to stall and come out and tell his story to the table, I don't want to hear it. Let the food speak for itself. This was a cool point about that. He said he went to one of the best restaurants in the world. It's supposed to be El Bulli. It's in Spain, and it has the longest tasting menu that he had ever experienced. He said after the fourth course... Everything started to taste the same. Unless you're doing little morsels, one bite, like 20 different pieces of sushi, one bite at a time, everything's going to start to taste the same if you're having the same course multiple times. Keep it simple. Meat, salt, pepper, and buns. Bourdain said, you either can or you can't in the kitchen. Good and evil doesn't exist. There's just a job that needs to get done. There really isn't much that you could get mad about in a kitchen environment. There's no, like, new... Yeah, people could send back food, but you're not getting, like, rando... You don't have to deal with the customers, know what I'm saying? This is why, though, you turn on each other so quick, there's no way to let off steam. Nothing really to get mad at. So when you do drop a knife, when you do fuck up an order, he's saying it's dog-eat-dog, dog, so... Don't take it personally. You got to have thick skin to be in the kitchen. When people rail on you, just know they're going to drop something eventually and you can let off some steam on them as well. One of the things he loved about the cooking career, reflecting a little bit, he said was cooking at other restaurants, covering shifts. You know, it's not your regular customers you have to fucking converse with. You just go there, maybe try some of their new food, see if you like any of the recipes, take that back to your place. Anthony respected any restaurant he went to that can make tripe taste good, which is the intestines. I tried to cook that shit once. It's ugh. for the YouTube video. I'll put up a video of it. It looks like um, it looks like a honey hive, but it's part of your body. It's an inside-out intestine. Tried to cook that. I tried to cook liver growing uh food. That shit'll keep you shredded though. You're like a you feel like a Native American when you eat it. It's just the it looks like a jellyfish. Crumbles in your mouth, really granular texture. I don't know, man. If you could stomach that shit, that is better for you than any sort of meats you're gonna get. You know what Taco Bell the meat is a little packet of powder they mix water with. That shit ain't meat. We're eating straight up dog food, ladies and germs. One of Bourdain's favorite things he learned in the kitchen was the nonverbal language. It feels like everybody could talk through their eyes, you know, call. <laughs> you could, like, curse out an entire customer by just looking at them and this entire the secret language you got with your hosts and your busboys. He loved that. So the ebb and flow, there is some fury, but there is happiness. This brings us to our final chapter, chapter 10. He called men at work misogynist. I think you mean to say zimzers at work. Just like the nonverbal language he learned, Bourdain picked up a lot of Spanish in the kitchen. He called Spanish the early morning language of Manhattan. Even if you're at your favorite Jewish deli bagel shop, the cooks in the back are most likely shouting Spanish. How much do you love when you drive by somewhere and there's some hard-working men at work playing a Spanish cha-cha fucking... Marianda, what is that called? Mariachi music? That sh it puts some pep in your step, baby. That is the early morning language of Manhattan. Bourdain is still close with Justo Justo. He is that 47-year-old co-chef. There's a picture of him in the last show I made. He talks about him all in Parts Unknown. Guy was a permanent resident of New York City, and he was running a restaurant for 22 years. Bourdain and them crossed paths many times. 
Husto was a neat freak. This guy was always getting the top grade cuts of beef, a bit of a perfectionist. He would use 70 to 80% of the animal carcasses in his recipes, turned the rest into dog food too. <laughs> Husto's dog food better than Taco Bell. Bourdain always knew when going to his restaurant that people treated him with the utmost respect. Lebardine, sorry, was the name of his seafood restaurant. Got the little crew here, Justo Bourdain and Eric Riper, the guy from Vietnam. They would always frequent Le Bardin. They love his seafood place, free food, free backroom, free booze. Justo would always show Bourdain and Riper how to skin fish. He taught them this new technique where you could gut it and uh, get all the hidden bones all in one foul swoop. Justo, Anthony's buddy, has the best knifemanship he has ever seen. Guy could process... 700 pounds of fish and half a day's of work. He is legitimately a machine on his own. Husto owns a house in the Dominican Republic where his extended family is. He's siphoning money off. He's doing that. Send it home where it costs more. Can't blame you. Jeff Bezos offshores money as well. It doesn't go to help struggling people, though. Big thing about Husto. We don't need to drag this last chapter out. He moved after 22 years in the city. El Bardin, Le Bardin, outside of the city so he was a new york resident for life he's now in jersey <gasps> no that's like the ultimate downfall for a new york city chef but he's like uh it's better lifestyle out here every time those crashes happen you're not going to survive as a restaurant in new york some eerie shit if you're a restaurant listener that's some insider info for you Bourdain is gearing us down towards the end. He admits he was angry most mornings when writing Kitchen Confidential. That's why it cuts so deep, why he took so many personal shots at people. Not like this book didn't as well. He had that whole chapter called Fuck You, Rachel Ray, or whatever. <laughs> whole Food Network family got trashed. He said it was too late when I realized the high that I was looking for had been fulfilled along the journey. Poetic way to say he was chasing the wrong highs throughout took him to the path that he was meant for so he says and this is what he's the best at like he's better as a storyteller and a traveler than as a chef in my opinion and in many's thinks being in a foreign land just like the kitchen working in the kitchen prepared him for being in the world non-verbal language you communicate through culture with people that's why he was so good like he, nobody else could have done his show it would have been so awkward if Who's that fat fuck, the English guy? I hate this one. I think it's James Corden. Imagine he flew to Vietnam, met some laborer in the fish market with one tooth. James Corden's like, you'll best be putting together a spread of a dinner for me tonight. He's a notorious dick to his uh, production assistants too, Corden. Bourdain had that beautiful soft side of him where he could fit in with like any family in the globe. He would go to Mardi Gras and the backwoods of louisiana and eat some boiled chicken he would go into the depths of ethiopia and with the skinniest families he would eat rice tiny bowls of rice to learn about the culture he was one of a kind you see these shows like dark tourists and crap like that on netflix you, you feel the tone man you feel what they're going for i love the formula but it's not the same. It doesn't hit the same. That Anthony Bourdain shit hits different, baby. Especially now that he's dead, it does give it a little bit of an extra oomph. It was eerie reading it, especially at the end, man. He gets so deep into the way he writes. But positivity at the end. He did bring up one of my favorites. Like uh, Anthony Bourdain saying he learned how to respect Emerald. Bam! And the showmanship. Bourdain bought up at the end Guy Fieri. Guy Fieri, oh, Guy Fieri, Guy Fieri. You can talk about him for hours. Diners, driving, dives. He's the best on Instagram. If you're not following his Instagram, you are missing out. He, like, is on the meme culture. He has great Photoshop people working for him. Also, follow Harry shit while you're on there. Guy's, like, literally an action figure. He has 30 catchphrases that he never says anything outside of. Bourdain. Is going, having worked on both sides of the machine, I respect this guy's hustle. He's made it simple for himself. He has, you pull the string on his back and he says one phrase, drives to a different diver, listens to doo-wop, and then gets in an awesome car. He's got a great life. Bourdain ends it. 
there are certain songs from my past I can't listen to, for they bring up too many old feelings, like perched over the edge of a cliff in the middle of the Caribbean. We all know this feeling he is able to write with simple ways that you could feel before, you know, rainy day, you're looking out the window as the radio plays in your car. That's what Bourdain is saying. Sometimes food, music obviously, but food can put you back in these places. And when food is your life, it takes you back to these kitchens. Every meal is like a trip into the past for him. Gave a little update on all the characters from Kitchen Confidential. People always ask Anthony Bourdain, do you miss the kitchen? It's been years since you've been a chef. And he says the same answer, hell no. There are parts I miss, but I had enough. I learned what I needed to, and I moved on to the next thing. But the one thing he does miss, from the kitchen at the end of a hard day's of work, after all the rushes are over, the printer, new order, new order, new order, special, special appetizer, is done printing. You are... Looking at each other, you're all panting, and you know, we did it. We're all still here. You and your coworkers, Husto, they put on the mariachi music. You swipe the floor, start passing the bottle around. That's the camaraderie he misses. Beautiful, beautiful book from Anthony Bourdain. We got one more in the chamber. Anthony Bourdain's Medium Raw, absolutely amazing. Thank you guys for staying tuned. I was ho- I hoped... I was able to do a little more justice than our previous edition, but his next book, the end-all be-all to the Bourdain legacy, I will be sure to treat with respect and humor, more humor than respect. This brings us to our book for next month. We got just a couple weeks, and ladies and gentlemen, August 1st, what do we like to do? We get into comedy, and Shaboy has taken a bit of a stifle with the fucking coronavirus. It, like, took comedy back a generation, you know. I'm not going to stay here and complain, but what I did have time to do while you're not on stage, obviously, become a fucking stellar broadcaster, as you all know, is writing. Big intro there. We are getting into Stephen King's On Writing. Stephen King, one of the most prolific authors in America and the most pages-for-page writer in history, has only two nonfiction books. This is one of them. On writing, I have synopsized Stephen King's process, how he pumps out thousand-page fictional masterpieces. He has a formula for success, as all the maestros do. We are going to be seeing behind the veil, behind the wizard's curtain, that is Stephen King. His beautiful ebb and flow, in and out, breaching dialogue, description, narrative building up characters he has the dark tower series is like holy fuck man it has like 10 books but this guy is creating universes he's creating what inside of his books man like they say programmers you create a bunch of video games and maybe his characters came to life he's a god a programmer stephen king has created an entire magical realm of shit it's gonna be a great read for any fiction writer out there anybody who's getting into the craft or just learning how to put pen to paper, learning how to mash the keys. This is going to be an essential listen for you. That is August 1st, Stephen King on writing. Thank you guys again for this very special Bourdain edition. It was a treat. I love you all. See you in just a couple weeks. Peace.